You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hi, I'm Joe Heath. And I'm Tony Heath. And this is the Watchathon of Rassilon. That you are listening to right now. Congratulations! You win a free iPod Nano. We can't commit to that. You win a not... An iPod. hour or so of entertainment. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we can promise that either. <laughs> Maybe just play the theme song. Okay. Today, we're going to be talking about the third serial of the 23rd season of Doctor Who, The Trial of a Time Lord Part 3, Terror of the Vervoids. It consists of four episodes that aired from November 1st, 1986 to November 22nd, 1986. Two facts! And I want to give a special shout out to Matt Golden for sponsoring this episode. Hey, thanks, Matt. Golden! You can check him out at matthewgolden.net. And today, we have a returning guest... Uh, it's Adam Clegg! Welcome Woo! back! Hey, thank you for having me back. Well, I say thank you, but I've had to watch Terror of the Vervoid, so it's more <laughs> of a, uh, thank you. <laughs> it's great to be back. Hey, yeah. was, it a, was it a true terror for you? It's one of those stories I'm fonder of than a lot of people, and that's true of trial in general. But I don't know why sometimes. <laughs> I go, why, why do I enjoy this? I think there are things to enjoy. but Yeah. <laughs> But how, how, before we get into that, how have you been? Uh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Had to isolate for 10 days because we got, we had the NHS app over here that pinged me and my partner like two days after my 40th birthday. So my first week of my 40s has been spent entirely in the flat. Oh no. But we're good. We're, we're this, we're almost, we're almost out of it now. Almost out of it. So that's good. And since I last talked to you guys, we've, we've adopted a little dog, which has been amazing. A lovely, lovely thing to do. But yeah. Yeah, just uh, waiting for everything to return to normal and expecting it never will. Yeah. I am starting to feel that way as well. (laughs) (laughs) We've had some new things happen since our last episode, too. Have we? Yeah. Oh, Uh, are we going to announce some of them? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, first off, I have pink hair now. <laughs> Joe's very cute, and that's and it's important that you all update your mental images accordingly. <laughs> I have uh, the top part of my hair is pink, and I'm very cute. Do you want to th- to tell your exciting news? Yeah, when is this going up? This goes up in like three weeks or so. Oh, okay. I'm just I'm I'm a little uh, superstitious about making announcements and the like. So um, this goes up in three weeks, which means I am well into the first couple of weeks of my new job. I accepted a new position. I'll be working uh, not at Retro TV anymore. That's a little sad, but also a little exciting. It's a little. I won't be I won't be making the unseen world anymore, but um my new job is very cool. The point is uh you won't hear me probably plugging the unseen world anymore, although it is still all up on a real good TV and it is still, you know, work that I'm very proud of. So if yeah. you want to watch it, do so. But it, it any new stuff that comes out won't have me behind it. You'll have worked on the Reed House one if that comes out. So Yeah, there's we've got a couple of things footage in the can that hasn't been edited yet that I, you know, did all the the interview prep for and did the interviews, but I think I know that the people who are, you know, it's being passed on to and they're all very talented and I'm excited to see what they do. I feel like I've talked for too much. No one actually cares. We should talk about uh, Doctor Who. (laughs) Okay, let's talk about Doctor Who. Well, let's dive into uh, Terror of the Vervoids, Trial of the Time Lord, Part 3. I never know how to say this, because it's like, it's technically Part, what, 9? Of Trial of the Time Lord. Time Lord, but this is uh, Terror of the Vervoids, Episode 1. Which I have called the Judas Goat. Mm. None of my episode titles for this are particularly exciting, so it matches the tone of uh, the <laughs> serial. It's frustrating. This is 
This is a frustrating series of television. That's what I'll say. It it is a bit of a bummer to me. Like it seems like every serial so far has like introduced an introdu- like introduced an exciting concept or idea and then the next serial does uh, absolutely nothing with it. But you're also about to enter a time there's no script editor on this. Eric Saywood has left. Yeah, cuz he left during or during Ultimate Foe, which I think was recorded before this. And if I realized watching the episodes, I I, I actually checked and there's no script editor credited so this is this is dot two without the clammy cold hand of eric saywood steering it for the first time and i do think it shows whether that's a good or a bad thing your mileage may vary but yeah interesting well, i you, knew he left i didn't realize it was already by this point usually when i say something is frustrating like the infuriating thing is all of the good parts that are in it that don't amount to something satisfying and so that's different from being like this was just boring and i didn't care for it when it's frustrating, it's like, I see all the good parts in it, and I want to see them... Pay off? Yeah, I want to see them, like, you know, come together in a satisfying way. <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about specifics. Okay, so we, we start off in the, the the trial where the doctor has been given some time to uh, grieve over uh, Perry and also to prepare his counter-argument, which he's like, I'm going to show you a story from <laughs> my future. Which is wild. <laughs> it is. It's, it's one of those things that should change how Gallifrey... Because before we've had the Matrix, it's always been indicated that it, it's the past, you know, it's from the memories of dead Time Lords. But this is just like, yeah, yeah, you can just pop in and see your future, which is is, is mind-blowing. It should change the way that we view Time Lords and, and everything, but doesn't. It doesn't. And I'll always say, my joke I always make about the story is, the Doctor could sit down and view and show them any stories from his future. So why didn't he show them the 11th hour or Blink? Because people like those. <laughs> that would have got them on the side. Also, this story is not great for his case. Like, even... Even if you take out the bits that have clearly been tampered with? Yeah, even knowing that it has been, yeah, tampered with. I mean, the way that the serial ends is like, yeah, this is not a story you show. <laughs> like, he doesn't disagree with the really damning parts of it. And that is also wild to me. He picked it! <laughs> I, he picked this one. I feel like from a story standpoint, it would also make more sense for this to be something the Valier does. Because like, cause then you could have the Sixth Doctor be like, well, I don't even know what it is yet. Like, I haven't experienced this. How can I defend against this? But instead, it's the Doctor doing it. And that seems like a weird choice. Because even he's like, I don't know what my motivation was. I wasn't there I haven't, for it. I haven't lived it yet. <laughs> I'm watching it, watching this just like you are. That's an odd choice. Also, we get a new companion, and that is also wild. Yeah, like, immediate. Well, not immediately. We get a few scenes before she shows up. But what we start off with is the Doctor introducing us to this case, which he's basically like, guys, check this out. It's going to be a murder mystery. <laughs> which I have to say, the murder mystery aspect of this thing is so, like... Oh, it's diabolical. <laughs> <laughs> It's so, but the mur- I, I, it's so bad because you literally at one point have a character reading Murder on the Orient Express. So, you know, they're, they're, it's kind of like a hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Except Agatha Christie, you know, structured her murder mystery so you had suspects. And <laughs> people had secrets. And things, but there's no suspects there's, until at the very end where they just go, oh, I don't know, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it. There was no murder mystery to this murder mystery whatsoever. It's also weird that you have this murder mystery, like one of these people is a murder. Murderer. While you also have other like creatures murdering people at the same time, it's like there's a lot, there's a lot going on today. Like everybody's doing something; they're all bad, which is fun. Like that is something that I do enjoy. I mean, the way stories work sometimes is you have, you know, it's simplified down to like you have a good group and a bad group, and so I do like stories where it's like you've got like five groups; they're all in their own stories, and they're all being kind of shady. I do enjoy stories like that. Where it's like, yeah. it's just these like wildly different groups of people with different motivations who accidentally are interacting. <laughs> but like the way the doctor frames it is not that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do want to say, I do really like the opening shot. This is actually a positive where it like zooms in on the ship and it's panning down the side of the ship. They splice in the footage of the inside of the liner, like through a window. And it's like, we start on the outside of the ship and oh, then we yeah, kind of go yeah. in and it's. Not seamless, but it's uh, it's pretty cool. 
It's a pretty neat effect, probably for the time. Um, but we sort of start meeting all of the guests who are our suspects. We meet a woman named Lasky who is complaining about her room because her stuff's not in it or she can't get in it or something. But it turns out her key is upside down. She was in nine and she was trying to get in six or vice yeah. versa. Yeah, one of those. Which, again, in any kind of murder mystery, that would have some significance down down the line. <laughs> but here it's just, she just can't read numbers. Also, can I say, played by Honor Blackman, who has always had this reputation as being this, like, this glamorous actress. You know, she was Pussy Galore, she was Kathy Gale in The Avengers. Here, they stick her in horrible tracksuits for like 90%. Here's the thing. I am so jealous. Could you imagine showing up to like a, a shoot and it's like, you're just going to wear sweats the whole time. And it's like, amazing. <laughs> I'm just going to saunter around in sweats. And that's going to be... But you remember the... um. There's like a clip that was going around. Somebody was interviewing somebody about a movie. Do you remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, someone was being interviewed about a movie. I, you're really ringing they're some bells space here. They're in space and they're wearing pajamas. And the interviewer was like, how great was that? And they're like, that was the best question you've ever asked. It was amazing. Our like outfits were, were basically just pajamas and like socks. And we just were wearing like socks on set. And they, they lose their minds. And that's what I was thinking about the whole time I was watching this. It's just being like, man, she's living the life. <laughs> she wore sweats to, to work for all of that filming. Amazing. She's not having to get up in some like weird costume with buttons and like weird. Sit for like a couple hours in makeup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She just gets to chill and hang out. I know the whole time I was watching this year, I was like, man, she looks comfy. <laughs> Do I need a tracksuit? <laughs> sure. We also meet the guy who does have her room. His name is Greenville. And this other guy thinks his name is Hallett. And he's like, no, I am Greenville. Leave me alone. Goodbye. Yeah, he totally pulled that off. Not suspicious at all. And then we see that Lasky and this, uh, because he also is like, you're an investigator. And he's like, no, I'm not. Leave me alone. And Why then, would you say that if you knew? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't help his case that he loudly says, no, I'm not this person you think I am. And I'm going to say this very loudly so everyone can hear. <laughs> it's just like, if you just whispered it to him, he might not be murdered. <laughs> and then Lasky and these other two guys, they're all scientists. Uh, Lasky, Bruckner, and I don't have the third guy's name here. It's something. We'll get to him eventually. Uh, I believe he's the one who did it. Spoilers. <laughs> But uh, they're all like... saved you a lot of time. You're welcome. (laughs) They're all like, oh no, there's an investigator on board. We should be worried. And so like, there's a lot of intrigue right here at the top, I guess. And then uh, Grenville changes his outfit into like a worker's outfit and sort of blends in with all these workers like in the the bowels of the ship, I suppose. That's a phrase that I hate. Bowels? Yeah. Or ship? I don't want to imagine things being in the bowels. The innards? No, that's also bad. I can't think of any other synonyms. Yeah, I know. It's, it is what it is. Inner workings. Okay. There we go. The butthole of the ship. No. <laughs> Spleen of the ship. <laughs> Spleen seems okay somehow. I think it's because it's not one you think about a lot, so you're like, I can't really conceptualize yeah, I have, that. Yeah, I have no concept of what the spleen is doing or, or how it how it is, so it's very abstract. And then we do cut to the TARDIS. We see the Doctor, first off, has a new vest that I really like. Oh, it's good. That's very colorful. And we also have a new companion that's just there. Her name is Mel. I really like Mel. I don't care for her introduction because she's very rude. She just fat shames the Doctor. I'd forgotten. This is obviously something she does with, with McCoy, but I've forgotten how much she does it in this. Like, the first thing we see her do is, like, make him exercise, and then she's basically like, you have to drink carrot juice, you fat bastard. <laughs> a slight misquote <laughs> there, maybe. But only slight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's basically just like, imagine being an audience member. You sit down, you're watching this, and Doctor Who fans now kind of know what her background was supposed to be. You know, the JNT document about being a computer programmer from Peas Pottage, etc. We know that, but imagine just sitting down as an audience member. You don't know who, who you don't know who this person is. She just appeared. Could be the Rani for all you know. She just appeared and is just like forcing the Doctor to exercise. And it's like I do feel sorry for Bonnie. She really str- has to struggle in those opening scenes just to try and make her character seem likable. Yeah, it's a hell of an opening. It's like when you meet somebody for the first time and they are 
they're just having like a shitty day and they're very short and you're like that person's is that person an ass and then you get to know them later and you're like oh that was bad circumstances this is this is bad circumstances for meeting a new person because it's just like ooh, we're just gonna talk about how fat someone is for like five minutes okay this is uncomfortable (laughs) I always wonder, obviously it wasn't wasn't possible after Colin was fired, but were they going to give her an introduction story in the next year? W- w- were they going to be that experimental to introduce a companion and then give them a, like their first meeting with the Doctor later? Because if they did that in the modern series, you'd be like, yeah, that's fairly standard. But then, I don't know, I can't imagine them doing that. And spoilers, but the last episode of Tribe of the Time Lord, her and the Doctor go off together, and it looks like they're being companion, Doctor and companion, even though they technically haven't met yet. This whole thing, it sums up my experience of Trial of the Time Lord really well, I think. Which is like, introducing a companion that way is interesting and cool. Where it's like, oh wow, so we have some insight into like, the future of this character, which is usually kind of like a big announcement of like a new companion. And while we were watching it, I was like, they're not, they're going to meet though, right? Like they're going to introduce her. <laughs> She's not just gonna show up at the end of the last one because that wouldn't make any sense. Because they haven't met yet. And that would be kind of messy and sloppy and confusing. (laughs) They had an extra year to put all these scripts together. That's what gets to me. They literally started when the hiatus started from scratch. They had like so much extra time. I mean, I love the documentaries about these stories because they're all just like them going, yeah, we, we hadn't worked out what was happening. And no, Philip Martin didn't know what was real in his script. And, um, and it's just like, how how did you not at least have a basic flow chart that went, this happens, this happens, this happens? Especially when this is, you're doing a lot of interesting things. There's a lot of weird firsts for it. And so you're like, wow, the show's do, like changing things up and, and doing new things. And also, it doesn't know what the fuck it's doing. <laughs> right. And this is just, like, a perfect example of that. Of, like, that's it's really cool to see, to introduce a companion this way. And then go back and get their backstory. Right? <laughs> or to, like, I mean, even, like, in the last serials, like, it's interesting that you're not sure what's real and what's not. But then you never, they, they didn't know. They didn't know what was real and what wasn't. It's so sloppy. Yeah, but I will say I do. I do think it's very interesting to to meet a new companion this way, and and I like her a lot, even I do if too. <laughs> even if like her first five minutes is her just being kind of rude. It's nice to have a companion who's enjoys enjoys being a companion. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean that's that's an important thing about Mel. You, you forget that you know she she seems to really enjoy being there. Yeah, it's it's a it's refreshing after. Uh, she doesn't seem to be Perry constantly being, being traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> and that that's a nice change of pace. <laughs> also, she gets to speak in her own accent, which helps, I think. <laughs> After we meet them a little bit, we go back to the ship. And we just sort of have some more interactions, setting up characters. We get to meet the Mogarians for the first time. You called them robots I for thought like they the were first robots. 10 minutes. <laughs> I thought they were. Well, I mean, they look, ro- they they talk with like a robot thing. And I'm pretty sure that's like back masking or something. It I sounds think like it is. It's amazing. I loved it. They always talk and, and literally every time someone's like, your translator's not on. And they're like, shit. Ah, and they press a button on their chest and then they speak in English. But like ne- at nearly every scene where they first start, they're like, your, your, your translator's not on. Your tra- Stop, stop. Your translator's not on. You're mute. You're You're mute. mute. (laughs) I thought it felt familiar. (laughs) Oh, shit. That is exactly what it is. They're always, they're like very paranoid. The Mulgarians like, what's happening? What's going on? I don't think they trust anyone else really to be competent. Well, they have reasons not to, which we will find out eventually. Uh, There's a whole political thing with them because you need more shit in this serial. Oh, man. There's so much about that that makes me uncomfortable which is that it's like their stuff is in there but not dealt with (laughs) not really there's just a lot of filler stuff to just pad out this mystery just concepts just throw some new more concepts at it we don't have to you don't have to deal with all of it just throw it in there there's literally a scene where there is political intrigue with them or whatever and they're like why is this important and the doctor's like oh the political stuff's not important it's something else that happened in that scene (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the thing that you're watching right now, not important. Don't worry about it. It's never going to come back up again. I don't feel like that's a great way to watch, to write TV. Maybe, maybe don't waste so much of my time. So then the pilot of the ship notices an unidentified craft nearby and gets stabbed in the neck by a mysterious figure. 
and then he passes out and the mysterious figure sends a signal off which the doctor and mel pick up it's a mayday signal the mysterious figure is greenville right like i don't even remember yeah okay <laughs> yeah yeah okay it's greenville i mean it's confusing when you've got everyone looking for a murderer and everyone also trying to find out who sent the mysterious signal and you're like there's a lot of trying to mysteriously find out what's mysteriously going on <laughs> <laughs> there's like Doesn't three help. mysteriously going ons at, all at once so they get the doctor and mel pick up the mayday and yeah this is like mel is ready for an adventure and i was like ah oh, nice thank god but the doctor is a l- little more wary he's like i he senses evil there's kind of a, a role reversal here where yeah. like the doctor's very hesitant to get involved in this at all it seems like and some of that could be matrix and some of it i think is he wants to protect mel in a way that he never seemed to care about with perry he's very committed to his weight loss that's why you know he's like if don't have mel it's not gonna happen this is saving me a fortune in diet coaches (laughs) she dies they they land on the ship and are pretty much immediately caught uh they're taking to captain travers who uh the doctor's like oh hey it's you captain travers and part of me is like have we met this guy before we have no it's commodore as he points out it's commodore now oh right commodore Oh man, my notes are just finding and replacing (laughs) Captain real quick. (laughs) I'm not gonna bother. I'll try to remember. And the doctor thinks that maybe he sent the mayday, but he did not. Is this a good moment to talk about Pip and Jane Baker's dialogue? Yes. Yes. I'm thinking of the bit where he turns around and goes, "The last time I met the doctor, I was in a was it a web of." intrigue and mayhem and you have to point at that point it's like i'm fascinated by pip and, J- pip and jane baker's writers again i don't necessarily think they're good but <laughs> there's no one else in this era like them they're slightly they're slightly out of time like they're not modern writers by the mid 80s standards and the, 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 they were veterans by this by this stage but it's like is this the kind of dialogue that they thought doctor who stories had i mean as somebody once described eric sayward's Sixth Doctor, and I feel it applies to Pip J. Baker to write him too, and it's it's unkind, but he speaks like a stupid uh, person's idea of what a smart person sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that maybe that's that's a little un- uh, unfair, but I like I'm fa- I am genuinely fascinated by their dialogue, and it, it, it but it's just it's so people have been writing so long, they've written so much. It's just like, is this what you thought Doctor Who sounded like? I I, I how hold a seance and I'll ask him, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is, it is kind of, like, weirdly flowery in a way. A little purpley. A little purple, yeah. They put too many words in there. Also, you have, uh, in this scene, which every scene that takes place on this set, where it's, like, it's sort of, like, the, the, the main deck, and there's, like, a big green screen where you can see space behind them. I don't know what it is. Every scene that takes place in this set, I cannot pay Can't attention pay to. Can't pay any attention to it. It was weird. There was something about the set that my brain was like, I don't know what they're saying. It was always boring exposition, too. That Everybody goes there to talk about exposition. They all they all go there. Well, but virtually every scene is either the Doctor of Mail or being accused of doing something and them going, no, I didn't do it. And the, the Commodore's like, didn't you? And then, no. Oh. And I was like, well, who did do it then? And there's like 500 scenes like that, I feel. And they're all, you're right, they're all on that bridge set. It's either that or it's like, we're going five parsecs to the left. It'll be close to the black hole. It's not a bad set, I don't think. But there, I mean, it was like my brain immediately turned off. And I was like, you have to, (laughs) you're doing this for a podcast. You have to pay attention, please. Oh, that's been our catchphrase for a while. (laughs) But yeah, it's like that. There's a, there's one scene later on where where there's the, the Commodore, or well, Captain or whatever, is, is basically <laughs> like, yeah, you're like you're like, oh, let's go five inches close to the black hole, and then he goes down and explains to everyone that they're going five inches close to the black hole. It's like, why did we have the scene of you telling them to do that if you're just going to have like the next scene is you're going to be explaining what we? Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also in the scene where we meet Travers, we also meet uh, Rudge. Who his whole thing is like, oh, I'm so close to retirement. <laughs> uh, I'm getting too nobody, old for this shit. Nobody has ever said that and then not died. <laughs> yeah, he keeps telling people, this is my last trip. I'm going to retire. He's like, I guess, head of security or whatever. But the doctor is taken away and Travers tells Rudge, be lenient on the doctor because he might solve the case. Whatever is going on here. All of the, the whatever's going on here. <laughs> What, Whatever what is, it is. What currently is the mystery going on? The Who, one guy oh, did get yeah, stabbed. That one guy got stabbed in the neck. I mean, he didn't die. He just got knocked out. He's he's still around for now. The doctor tends to like solve problems. So he may cause problems, but he also solves problems. So maybe he can solve it. 
So don't be too like, hard Keep on an him. eye on him. Don't let him really mess anything up. But uh, meanwhile, a, a Mogarian is sneaking around. So you got you've got Glenville sneaking around. You got a Mogarian sneaking around, or maybe they're the same guy. I think they're the same guy. It, again, I can't keep track. He steals some silver discs, little small silver seeds. Can I tell you? They look great. The whole the, from the first time I saw them, I was like, I want to chew on those. It's like those look like they would be so satisfying to bite into. And then later the doctor eats one and I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> I, wanted, I did want to see somebody eat one of those. And it's very satisfying. Although he eats them right after like the person tells him what they are and like how valuable they are. It's like one one of those seeds could, I don't remember, turn into a billion fruits or something. <laughs> and he's like, oh. And then he has one as a snack. So he steals them. Nearby are some glowing pods, like plant pods. Those will become important later. Uh, so Mel says she's going to try to solve the mystery and poke around a bit while the doctor can ask for uh, the passenger list. But she is almost immediately caught sneaking around and she's like i was just looking for the gym that's my thing that's what i do i'm all about exercise and fitness that is my main personality trait at this moment (laughs) and uh she's taken to the gym they put these headphones on her that gym is not impressive no it's not uh but she the music i like the music on the on the (laughs) headphones it's so cheesy but while she's in there dolan that's the other guy dolan comes in and is like somebody stole some stuff from our hydroponics center you gotta come with me he's saying this to lasky and then they both leave and i guess i don't know if mel heard any of that but she's definitely in the background for that scene but then she does hear something over her headphones someone is talking to her and it's basically arranging a meetup he's like i'm the guy that sent the mayday meet me at this time at this place then uh we cut back to the like main lobby and the doctor is flirting with the uh the receptionist i think her name is janet a lot of people thought janet was going to be the person who did it apparently she would be the most of it in, in, in like proper murder mystery uh, you know she is a named character that has access to everywhere and wouldn't be a suspect uh, an obvious suspect so yeah i can understand why people go i actually think watching it today i was like you know, Janet really should have done it. But sadly, no one ever says, damn it, Janet, which I feel was a missed opportunity. <laughs> that is very sad. But he, he does a magic trick and pulls out a bunch of flowers. He's like, these are for you. Give me that passenger list. Has that ever worked? Have you ever been like, I need I need to like a list of everyone who's staying at this hotel? No? What about pff, now? Abracadabra. <laughs> Give me that sensitive info. I think I would do it. This is why I don't work in the hospitality industry. I might do it for like a good, some good food. Like just some Slim Jims? I was thinking more like a steak. I don't know if I'd want to eat a steak that some guy pulled out of his like coat. I mean, I wasn't, I was just, I'm just letting you know what my rates are as far as bribery goes. Okay. Magic does not have to be involved. <laughs> But I would probably give you sensitive information for a good steak dinner. Oh, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I hope the people from your new job don't hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about like if I worked at a hotel. I'm right. not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do any like HIPAA violations or anything. <laughs> it's noted here <laughs> <laughs> on the record. I won't do any HIPAA violations. <laughs> He doesn't get the passenger list, but Rudge comes up and is like, eh, give it to him. Uh, I'm retiring anyway. Have I said that enough yet? The yeah, doctor might be retiring. The doctor is not, does not recognize anybody on the list, so this was pointless. This whole uh, scene, <laughs> all of it. He's like, yep, don't recognize anybody. And then Mel comes up and says, you know, someone wants to meet you, gave us a uh, time and a place. They said it through these headphones. And he's like, uh, nope. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm not going to do that. That it seems like a trap. I don't want to be a Judas goat. Uh, he says something like this like every episode. Just some random weird like thing that I've never heard of. <laughs> maybe it's a popular thing. I don't know. Or maybe it's this the Pip and Jane. Maybe this is Pip and Jane dialogue. They do have a tendency to like stick in kind of I wouldn't say obscure references, but maybe references that. Like I said, they were older writers by the time this came around, and the references their generation might get, but like, I think even kids in the 80s, especially now, are looking going, what? <laughs> Judas Goat. 
Judas go. But then we find out that basically he was lying to make Mel not go. He was going to go there alone so Mel wouldn't get involved in it. At least that's what he says. Because they both show up at the place, the meeting place. They're in a messy, very messy room. They go there. There's nobody there. It's just the place has been trashed. And there's a single shoe, Cinderella style, just... (laughs) And they also find the seeds, the uh, the little Demeter seeds. That they're good to crunch. That they're good to crunch. And then they find the other shoe, Travers and Raj find the other shoe at a waste disposal thing. It's like a incinerator or something. And they assume that Glenville has been murdered and disposed of in this waste disposal unit. Because the shoes match, again, much like Cinderella. But the doctor says he doesn't know him or why he would have sent the Mayday. Then later he does realize he does know him because it's the other guy that he was saying he wasn't. Hallett. (laughs) See, why is this so complicated? (laughs) This seems needlessly complicated. I I understood what you said because I watched the serial. (laughs) But listening to that sentence made me feel dumber. (laughs) He recognized him. Yeah. Well, that's later. Right now he doesn't know who he is because there's no body. It's just shoes because... That was fake. (laughs) Anyway. God. So, Mel wants to investigate the hydroponic center, but the doctor does not. And uh, he's just going to just do some exercises. He's like, you go do whatever you want to do, but I'm I'm done. And this is at the point in the trial where the doctor stands up and says, whoa, this is different. I watched this earlier. This is not what happened. This is not what I saw. I wouldn't have let her go and do that by herself. And then they're like, are you saying that the Matrix has been tampered with? And he's like, yes. I've been saying that this whole time. I haven't stopped saying it. I feel you should have also stood up and gone, but I chose the version with the additional CGI effects. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, Mel is caught sneaking around the hydroponic center by uh, Edwards, the guy got stabbed in the neck. And he's like, what are you doing? And she's like, I just want to take a look. And he's like, well, don't do it by yourself. I'll give you a tour. What? He says a very specific line. That I want to hear finished. It, what is it? It's like, we don't want you breaking your neck, at least not until... Argh. But yeah, it's one of those lines you're like, we don't want her to break her neck until what? <laughs> at what point do you want Mel to break her neck? Because that's a very specific thing to want to happen. <laughs> but he does. He sadly does not get to finish this perplexing thought. Because he touches the the uh, door and it electrocutes him. And uh, shocks all of the pods. And uh, Mel screams at the same... Is this the scene where she screams at the same pitch of the the theme tune? Yeah, same note. Same note. Uh, As as requested, because, you know, Bonnie Langford is an absolute professional, and if you ask her to do that, she'll do it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think she does it twice. I think she does it at the end of the uh, second or third episode as well. This is, like, one of the first... One of the few cliffhangers in this season that is not a zoom on the Doctor's face. (laughs) Yay! (laughs) That is the end of episode one, and we are now into episode two, which I have called The Brown Study. Okay. That's another one of those things where I was like, I don't know if this is a reference I don't get, but... Feels a little like Clue. Because there's a bit where someone says, I can't remember if it's Mel or the Doctor is in a brown study, which I mean, I guess means like, you're moody and contemplative. I just, I wish this was more like Clue. (laughs) <laughs> I have said that. I wish so much. This was more like the film Clue. I wish at one point the doctor got up and go, and I'm going to go home to have sex with my wife. And just <laughs> left. Or Tim Curry turns up or something. Flames, Flames on, on the, the side, side of, of my, my face. face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'll, I'll go on a Blackman be it delivering that line. I can, I can, I can literally hear it doing that. <laughs> I will say Clue is the movie is also like wildly complicated and hard. It is a little hard to follow. But you don't care because it's just pure fun. Well, I was gonna say it's also intentionally. This is this yeah. is what I was talking about when I was like, everybody has you know something going on, and it's might it's not necessarily related to the mystery you're trying to solve. Clue is the perfect example of the thing I was talking about. Communism was a red herring. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just chaos and fun. This is just chaos. And just my brain's like, I can't. There's le- There should be more jokes. There should be more jokes. That would save it, I think. There are some jokes, but there could be more. Uh, so yeah, Edwards is now dead. One guard takes Mel away while another is uh, killed by a POV monster. So our body count is rising up. The doctor says that this didn't happen either in the trial. He's like, 
Because they're like, look, more people di- di- dying on your watch. And he's like, no, they didn't. I was there. I saw the... Or he wasn't there because it's from the future. He's he like, I watched the thing already. I just watched this. I should know the plot. And they also set up this thing that becomes... Never really becomes important. There's a thing that happens in it, but it, is, it has no... There's no, nothing It doesn't really connect happens. back to anything else. Not really. Not enough. But they keep showing this, ominously showing this isolation room and like there's something in there that's like trashing things occasionally because they'll bring stuff in and then like they bring in food and they bring it out and the plate smashed or whatever and you're like what's going on in that isolation room and everybody wants to know and it's we'll tell you later it's not important (laughs) yeah we'll find out at the end of this episode it's a really weird ship because it seems to be like a luxury cruiser but they're also like we have very valuable (laughs) metals that people might want to steal so we have a security officer in the hold but also spoilers we have we'll also provide room for your hideously mutated lab assistant (laughs) And I'm just like, what cruise ships do this? You don't get that on P&O. It's not something they advertise. Gigantic plant pods as well. This thing does it all. Then there's a scene that I actually do think is funny. We're back in the gym and the doctor is talking to to Lasky or something. And he mentions having a double pulse. And she's like, what are you, a comedian? And he says, no, he is a clown. <laughs> I, I do love that. That's one of, I think, Colin's best moments in this story. Just, yeah. It's so good. So true. So you're like, oh, he's self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the everybody's questioning Mel, thinking that she had something to do with the death of Edwards. But then they find out that Edward's body is missing, as is the uh, the other guard that was down there. So the, Mel's like, I've been with you the whole time, so I'm off the hook here. But also, they go down there, and all of the pods are empty. Oh, no. Oh, no. Mel asks the doctor about the seeds... And he plays keep away with them. That's cute. I like their dyna- dynamic a lot more. Like, they still have kind of, like, their bickery and ban- But it's more like banter and not bickery. They are both enjoying it. Yeah. No one feels like they're being bullied at all. <laughs> Except for the doctor a little bit. Yeah. And that's 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 a little bit better, I think. Because <laughs> he's, he's in a position of power. That's punching up. <laughs> <laughs> But he asks Lasky about the seeds, and she's like, you have the seeds? And calls security on him. I love the way that this scene resolves. He has the seeds. She's like, you stole, those were mine, you stole them. And then, like, calls security, and security comes over, and he's like, no, we found them. And she's like, oh, you found them? Tell me more. (laughs) Yeah, because eventually she's like, why is the security guy here? And they're like, you called him. She's like, oh, yeah. I forget it. I for, forget about that. <laughs> but also, the scene ends, and the doctor keeps the seeds. She's like, "These were are very important. They're very rare and very important, and they were stolen from me. And here, let me give you the whole background on what they are." And then the doctor just keeps them. I do like what how a bizarre th- exchange. <laughs> I do like how this exposition is dropped, though, about the seeds and stuff, which I don't even remember the specifics. But, like, Mel and Lasky are discussing it, and any time the doctor tries to chime in or ask a question, he gets interrupted. And it just keeps happening over and over again. Yeah, that is fun. And that's always a good bit. So, and this is, this is where he eats one of them, and it's very satisfying to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody just starts, like, just chilling out, I guess. Oh, and the this Mo- is when Galaga happens. Yeah, that man is playing Galaga. The Mogarians are just straight up playing Galaga. Did they have to get the rights for that? I don't know. Part of me was like, am I watching a version with updated CGI and they just put Galaga in there? But I think that is the original shot. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I don't think it's an add-on. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were loads of those kind of games around at the time, so I doubt anyone was particularly worried about copyright. Mm. That's a good point. If they made it now, I presume it'd be like, I don't know, Grand Theft Auto or something. Um, I, was just, I was just surprised they didn't put in some like something that wasn't so recognizable, you know? But uh, this is another scene where uh, Mel uh, fat shames the doctor because he's going to eat some snacks and she makes him stop. They looked really good, too. <laughs> he already had those seeds. And this is the senior time out where the li- the liner has changed course and will be passing by a black hole. And uh, the Mogarians are like, I don't like this. Or Earthlings. Oh, we have a lot of politics to talk about. We have a lot of opinions and feelings and we have very specifically been wronged. And the episode's not really interested in addressing any of our grievances. Okay. <laughs> Tony is very, very I- observant. <laughs> I was not. I love this next scene. there's three Mogarians. They all turn on their... Translators. Uh, translators. But one of them doesn't, but it's still speaking English. And Tony's like, ugh, 
continuity error. I was like, that bugs me. It <laughs> bugs me that that guy didn't turn his on. They clearly set up that they all have things, and that one guy didn't do it. And I was like, that's a that's an annoying mistake. <laughs> That's when the value is like, I'm getting bored by these politics. And the doctor's like, yeah, forget the politics. You missed a clue. We literally don't care that the Earth has, uh, sounds like, colonized and destroyed this planet. <laughs> yeah, they stole a bunch of their stuff. <laughs> We're not concerned about that. There was a clue. Is, it, is, it, is this what people are referring to when they say Doctor Who didn't used to be political? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, no, it's fine, whatever, losers. <laughs> Then the next scene is one of the Mulgarians passes out. Well, did from... you say what the clue was? No, it hasn't been revealed yet. Oh, it's okay. It's about to be revealed. Uh, one of the Mulgarians passes out from a poison drink. I think it says it's a poison drink, but we saw Janet give them that drink. So that's another... Should have another... been Janet. Should have been Janet. But he passed it. He's dead. And they remove his mask. And they're like, you can't remove his mask. They can't breathe oxygen. And the doctor's like, well, he's not a Mulgarian. And he pulls off the mask and it's Grenville. And... Wait, does that say you can't? his mask because he can't breathe oxygen he's dead <laughs> well they don't know he's dead yet he's not breathing anything i mean that's fair but they pull off his mask and it's grenville and then that's when the doctor's like oh wait that's hallett i know hallett why you've been saying grenville this whole time but he was an undercover agent and he he faked his own death in the pulverizer thing but and, now he's dead for real but now he's dead for real this isn't complicated <laughs> no and then the court's like how did you know he wasn't a mogarian and he's like play that footage back we got to fill time and then the one doesn't touch the translator. He's like, he spoke English without the translator. It was intentional. I was very excited. Like, I was very excited. proud of you. <laughs> How does it feel to be as smart as the doctor? I solved your <laughs> riddle. <laughs> that is kind of satisfying. I feel like it's ultimately like pointless, but it's cool. <laughs> yeah, they actually set something up. They paid it off. That's the thing. They did it this one time. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I didn't catch it, so... Kudos. The doctor and Mel go to the hydroponic center. The doctor calls Mel an elephant? But I think he's talking about her memory because she's got like a perfect recall. doesn't forget. She's like, oh, that's a compliment. And he's like, I could be calling you an elephant. Maybe it's not a compliment. Ha, take that. He does another magic trick where he makes a leaf appear that he got from somewhere. I don't even remember. And he makes it go from one hand to the other. But the shot is so poorly framed, you can see what he did. Like he just stuffed it in his... It just looked really bad. You could see where everything was. Anyway, he also stands inside one of the pods and it's it's like, hey, look, it's me sized. But he's wondering what was inside them and what, what isn't there now. Throughout this whole serial, Dolan, Bruckner, and Lasky are just bickering the whole time about whether they are doing a bad. <laughs> they don't say any specifics. And it gets very frustrating. And every time it cuts back to him, it's the same conversation, like every time, just maybe in a different location. <laughs> and they're uh, they're being watched through the vents, too, by something. There's a lot of, like, people saying borderline... Incriminating? Incriminating things while somebody watches from the darkness. But this, it's so... Everything's so vague. I'm like, well, I can't keep track of any of this because there's nothing solid to hold on to. Give me a word. Give me a noun, please. I'd like to buy a vowel. I have a note here that says Kimber is stabbed in the neck by a leafy hand. Who's Kimber? <laughs> is that the old guy? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the old guy that recognized Hallett. Yes, yes. Okay. Probably. He's a victim of, of the vervoids, but not of the murderer. <laughs> I will say, uh, God. when this is all we can see of the vervoids, I'm like, that's a, that's pretty neat. That's a pretty neat design. They're just some plant boys. We, I don't think we fully see them until, like, the next episode. We just see them in the shadows and stuff. The Doctor and Mel see Lasky come out of the isolation room. They're like, we gotta get in that isolation room. So the Doctor sets off the fire alarm and says, oh, somebody in the, the lobby, the main area, there's a fire. Go get it, guard. And the guard runs off and they grab some masks from the fire alarm area and an axe, I believe. And they sneak into the isolation room. Inside, they find a hybrid plant human being person thing honestly that looks super rad it is probably some of the best design in the episode and this is like what the first and last time that you see it pretty much you don't really see it much more than this mel screams again at the theme tune level and the camera zooms in on the doctor's face for a reaction but he's wearing a full fucking mask so you don't see anything also like mel is the one who is screaming so you think you would do a close-up on her 
who is reacting, whereas the doctor who's not visibly reacting at all. Well, but maybe it's the doctor screaming. He's wearing a mask, so he can't tell. We've always thought it was Mel, but maybe Colin Baker has a particularly <laughs> high pitched scream. It's been the doctor That's this true. whole time. From what I heard, J and T wanted every cliffhanger to end on a close up of the the doctor to the point where he would change it in editing to that and we'll see that at the end of episode three i can't wait till we get to it because it's so stupid <laughs> um but that's the end of episode two we are now into episode three which i've called the elephant's child Ooh. i don't remember why i called it that some other piece of dialogue but uh the scientists uh you know blasky bruckner and dolan find them in there and pull them out and s- explain that, that that person was ruth a former assistant who got infected uh she had a cut on her thumb and then some plant stuff got in there and they messed her up gotta use that hand gel <laughs> i mean if you learned anything it's gotta use that hand gel wash your hands wear a mask six feet apart blow the vervoid particles away <laughs> <laughs> and then the doctor is arrested not for breaking into the isolation room but for uh setting off a false alarm and they're, they're like we gotta take you to travers and he's like I'll go there myself. I know the way. And then he walks in one direction and then everyone's like, no, it's the other way. And he's like, I know that. That's the sixth doctor's thing is he always heads in one direction, but he needs to be heading in another direction. I like how each doctor sort of gets like one re- sort of recurring gag. Like five had the coin flips and he's got this. I'm heading this direction. No, doctor, it's this direction. But he goes in and fills in Travers on all of the info he's obtained so far. Janet also says that Kimber is missing the old guy. So Mel goes to check out his apartment. And finds a leaf in a shower. And then we finally see a vervoid. And it's full glory. And, uh... Are we gonna talk about it? Do you know the story about W. H. Smith and the Dot Two magazine, which had a vervoid on its front cover? No. W. H. Smith it was, is a news agent... Well, kind of basic news agent chain around here. One of the big, biggest in the, in the country. And in the 90s, Dot Two magazine, they had a, an issue which had a vervoid very clearly on the front cover. And I believe what happened was that W. H. Smith basically phoned them up and went, we're not, we're not going to display this. And I'm like, why not? And they're like, because it's obscene. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they were eventually persuaded to because they were like, it's not obscene, it's just a 1980s Dot 2 monster that happens to look like both sets of genitalia. <laughs> slightly. At an angle. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's just I presume whoever was designing these had never seen a George or a Keith painting in their life to be honest but there's some interesting choices put it that way it's like a penis with a vagina mouth inside of a vagina it's a lot it's layered you did um an article for the dip right and that yeah. was the first time that you ever heard about them yeah well i'd heard about them before but i'd never really seen them but i was like i i know that they're bad and then i looked them up and i was like oh boy oh boy because i did a, a top 10 uh phallic props in doctor who and this came in at like number two or three so it wasn't top no that's a rato oh you're right it is yeah. isn't it though uh since writing that article i i should have included but i didn't know about it until after i wrote it i should have included another pip and jane baker episode mark of the ronnie for the the tree its limb gets erect i forgot about the tree there's so many dicks in doctor who <laughs> i will say like a rato is penis shaped this one like is not only penis shaped but penis colored yeah it's bad but they're they're piling up bodies. That's that's basically all they do. This whole serial is kill people and throw them in a pile. Put them on the dead body pile. We'll figure out what to do with that later. They talk occasionally, but they never say anything important. Just we want to kill. <laughs> Sorry, I just read your notes. We finally see a vervoid end. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty pretty much it. Who oh boy. And also, like, when I uh, did my article, I only saw pictures of them. I didn't see them moving, so. It was, a, it was a horse whole in motion? Yeah, it's horse in motion. <laughs> they also, like, wobble a lot. They'll just stand there talking and then wobble. Not while they're talking. After they're finished talking, they just wobble. And then they release gas from their mouths, which absolutely cracks me up for some reason. It's just uh, altogether unpleasant. <laughs> altogether unpleasant. Bruckner is shredding papers in the hydroponic center about their research, and Dolan catches him and locks him in the room to go get Lasky to talk some sense into him, because he's like, this is all bad, this is our fault, they're going to find out about us. So, because yeah, my next scene says Mel asks Lasky, Lasky about the leaf, but... Lasky doesn't want to talk about it because she's working out. And then Dolan comes in and is like, Bruckner's destroying papers. I'm not your fucking Google. Yeah. (laughs) 
And then Dolan comes in and is like, Bruckner's destroying all our stuff. And she's like, but I'm working out. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like you do get these people who are there. They're so focused on their their fitness routine, though. You know, it's just like houses on fire. I have to do five more burpees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh God, I hate burpees. Burpees are terrible. We were doing like a, a YouTube video and that Tony had found, and oh God, the burpees were terrible. <laughs> I just stopped doing them. I refuse to do any exercise. It sounds sounds like a word I'd say to a toddler, like, oh, have you just done a burpee? <laughs> you know? I know, I'm, I'm 40 years old. I'm not doing something called a burpee. I refuse. Don't do it. It's not worth it's it. It's unpleasant. Yeah. But she does go to talk to Bruckner and Mel's like, well, hey, Dolan, do you know anything about uh, these leaves or those pods? Can you give me any info? And he's like, the pods just had fruit. They're fine. Just fruit. And then he leaves. Uh, and then she hears something coming from the vents. So she shoves the headphones in there in the vents and then amplifies it in the control booth that's right next to the gym. And she hears the vervoids uh, talking and saying that they're going to kill all animal kind. And then she is grabbed by somebody or something. And uh, she is thrown into the towel bin, uh, which I guess they just destroy their towels? Yeah, I was thinking that. I was like, do you not have laundry on this place? You literally just burn them up <laughs> it's like how many towels do you have on this on this ship how filthy are these people and also i just want to say mel is put into the into the towel disposal unit and then he just drapes a single towel over <laughs> her and i hope that no one opens it and just like sees a wom- woman lying there a single towel over her head like she's a parrot like if she can't see she won't make any noise <laughs> Well, the perfect plan. And the guy comes in to take out the trash, the towels, and the doctor comes in at the same time and makes a very terrible, oh, I wish I could get rid of my waste so easily. <laughs> and the guy does not laugh and leaves. <laughs> The guy's like, okay, we have talked about weight too much. And then the doctor goes and he plays the recording and hears the thing about killing all animal kind. And then he hears Mel screaming. And then he hears his stupid joke again. <laughs> I wish I could get rid of my wa- my waste so easily. Then he's like, oh, I, uh, I know what's happening. And he runs and he saves Mel from being pulverized. Gets her out of it right before she's thrown into the thing. And he's like, Mel, don't throw the towel in yet. It's just... <laughs> He's just saying a whole bunch of terrible puns. Which is like, she's about to be thrown in a fire. <laughs> now might not be the right time. <laughs> It'd be a little bit like if he woke her up and was like, Mel, Mel, I made this great joke about my waist to this guy that I want to tell you. <laughs> get it? Because, like, my waist, like, but also waist is... Disp- you get it. <laughs> And then they return to the booth and the tape is gone. And they're trying to figure out who did it. And they have like a brief discussion about gender. He uses like he, him pronouns. I don't remember what he says, but like whoever took care of her and threw her in the thing. And she's like, it could have been a woman. What I saw from the making of of this, there was like a description of who she is that Pip and Jane got. Oh, it's. (laughs) And it's so gross. And it's like, she's like one of those feminists. Who are all very vocal about it, but then when shit hits the fan, she's like screaming and needs rescuing. Do you ever think John Nathan Turner might have had some issues he was working through? (laughs) It seems possible. possible. I guess this is that feminist scene where she's like, maybe it was a woman who threw me in there. I'm not that big. A woman could have definitely thrown me in the towel bin. That's another point in Janet's favor. But then they sp- split up to track down clues. My next note just says, a Mogarian really doesn't want coffee. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he says sorry after he knocks it over. And they're like, are you being sarcastic? <laughs> I presume you are. You just go, oh, with, your, with the coffee. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look accidental. It looks very intentional. Yeah, she's like walking next to me, just like flips it out of her hands. But yeah, they're very, very angry. So I, I think it wasn't an accident. And then the doctor takes an axe to the security systems. And he's just standing there very joyfully while everything, the communication systems have all been destroyed. The doctor gets up in the trial and is like, again, this is not true. And like, that one seems very clear that it's not true. Like, I feel like somebody in the trial would have been like, yeah, that seems particularly fishy. Like, that doesn't even make sense given everything that we've seen so far. Right? But they don't care. They're like, the Matrix never lies. You know, you show some people the truth and they just don't want to believe it. Well, you know, the mainstream Matrix won't report on what's really happening. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, meanwhile, Mel is searching for clues and then has to hide in a shower from a vervoid. And I believe that's when the vervoid eventually does the like, shh. I think we've skipped past the part I meant to comment on, which was vervoids know to turn on a shower. Oh, right. Because when they kill the old guy, they turn <laughs> on the shower. And I remember, I, it's only, I, I have watched this story on and off since I was about, I think, 16, 15, 16. And it's only now, like I said, turned 40 a week ago, that I was watching it going, but how does it know how to turn on a shower? (laughs) (laughs) like, when did it learn how plumbing works? (laughs) I didn't even think about it, but you're right. How does it know that in human society, if we hear someone in the shower, we're not just going to burst in? What's going on? That's a very good point. There's there's actually a lot of knowledge that went into that. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, did the professor just talk you through... I mean, they say you talk to your plants to help them grow. Did she just explain plumbing when they were growing? I don't know. She just read, like, uh, tropes, TV tropes to the plants. You need to know every sort of, like, thing that could happen. So if in, if at any point you decide to kill someone, you know how to get away with it. Distract attention. Maybe it was just taking a shower. Maybe it wasn't, like, oh, a Maybe ploy. it was an accident. Maybe it was just like, what does this do? <laughs> And it just happened to coincidentally lead, help. Yeah, yeah. Help lead him away from discovery. Then the next scene is Lasky comes in and is mad at Bruckner for destroying the stuff. And then he's mad at her for wanting glory and fame or whatever for whatever research they're doing. Uh, and then he attacks her and runs off. And again, Bruckner is not the bad guy, <laughs> the bad guy but like everybody in this like does something terrible, I feel like. <laughs> So the Vervoids say Bruckner is their new target because he wants to destroy them. He's like, we did this. We brought the Vervoids. We got to destroy them. But Bruckner runs into the to the cockpit area that makes us sleepy and uh, shoots Travers in the hand with... By the way, we should talk about these guns. They look like they're holding them upside down. I got to appreciate, though, the like... We got to design another, a different looking gun and like prop just being like another one. Why don't we just turn this one upside down? <laughs> That's different enough, right? It's just a drill that they're holding upside down. Leave us alone. We're tired of designing guns. So he takes control of the ship and they le- like gets everyone out of there except him. Bruckner takes over and he's going to destroy those plants. And yeah, and it's at this point that like the Vervoid does vape at mail and um... <laughs> After destroying the room, he just trashes it. Then Bruckner flies the ship towards the black hole. And that should have been the cliffhanger. Oh yeah, that model shot is 100% where the, you know, the credit's supposed to kick in, isn't it? It is. Yes, we're like, oh shit, we're heading towards the black hole. And then J&T was like, no. And then it has the, the scene that would basically be recapping this for the audience at the beginning of the next episode. That's why that happens. That's why... He comes in and is like, that, I just did that thing I just did. Yeah, he's like, uh, Bruckner's heading towards the black hole, the doctor says. And then it zooms in on his face, which is completely unnecessary. We already know this. But it would make sense at the beginning of the next episode to sort of... Where it was supposed to go. To refresh the audience, who's tuning in a week later. But that's the end of episode three. Did JNT just particularly like Colin's hair? No, can I just point out, actually, Colin Baker and, and Bonnie Langford are the most perm TARDIS team that we'll ever have. <laughs> For only two serials. But that's the end of episode three. We're now into episode four, which I have called The Hijack Sideshow. I don't remember what that's about either. Uh, so Mel escapes the gas. Everyone burns their way into the, the cockpit. They get a torch out and they, like, burn a hole in the wall. But when they do, gas starts pouring out. And they realize that Bruckner is dead. He's dead in there. And they're like, what do we do? We can't get in there. There's like poison gas. And they're like, we'll just send the Mogarians in there because they have those masks and they don't, they breathe their own air supply anyway. I, th- I think the best thing about that though is it's the security chief who suggests it, who's been fairly genial and a bit useless, but says, I know exactly what to do in the most evil voice he could have put <laughs> on. It's like, yes, now I am evil. Let me call my evil helpers. Because he suddenly, he just, it's telling you about his tone of voice in that line is just like pantomime esque. <laughs> <laughs> and again, he's not even the ultimate bad guy. Everybody's the bad guy in this. A little bit. So they send the Mogarians in there, but then they're like, guess what? We got control now. This was a ploy. Ha ha, we're hijacking the ship. And we've done it with the help of Rudge. Basically, his explanation for it is like, I just want some money. I want some compensation before I retire. Like, nobody can retire anymore. That's a joke. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, that is my retirement plan, yeah. essentially, at the moment. But, I mean, it almost makes sense, this one, because basically he has been shat on throughout the entire... People have been rude, and no one's been nice to him for the entire previous three episodes. You know, the Commodore's always pretty much like, you're an idiot. And everyone treats him like an idiot. So I, I kind of almost buy this. And it does tie in with the, the Mulgarians political thing a little bit because basically they want their metal that was stolen for them, from them basically is on this ship and they want it back basically. And Rudge is helping them out and he's going to get a cut of it. I think the difference between Classic Who and New Who is that in New Who somebody pointed out to RTD that maybe the Doctor had left the Ood to die and hadn't really looked at their political circumstances very well, so they did Planet of the Ood. Here, we have the Mugarans who are just like, our planet is literally being plundered by Earth people, and there's never any follow-up on that outside the story. It's like, Meh. stuff happens. <laughs> it's like in Star Wars. Was that a joke that you guys did in one of the the Exquisite Corpses? It was, yeah. Somebody was like, there was like a new Jedi and she was like, can we talk about slavery? <laughs> Do you think as like a force for good in the universe, we could maybe all get like put our heads together and, and come up with a way to uh, stop human slavery? <laughs> Star Wars is very, has a lot of slaves in it. And then uh, then maybe we, should, we could also talk about like robot liberation. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, they're mean to droids. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a messed up universe. We also before like he does his big like this is why I'm turning on you and working for the Mogarians. Mel comes up to the doctor and the doctor sort of like warns her away and is like very loudly like, "Oh boy, we're being hijacked." And she goes and warns everybody in the lounge and then she runs off with them before they can be caught. I think it's her and Lasky and Doland, maybe. They are not captured. They're just sort of running around trying to fix things. They actually try to run to the to, to send out a, a call, but all of the comms have been destroyed. Presumably by the doctor. Actually, who did destroy the comms? Presumably the murderer. But I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so she's like, I don't I don't know what to do. Let's let's head into the vents. So they all crawl into the vents. Then someone we don't see kills the Mogarians. Why don't we see them? Because if it's the guy who's running, you know, who turns out to be the murderer, whose name I've forgotten. Doland. He's running around with Janet and Mel, and they need to get rid of the Mogarians anyway. So why is, is, does he kill them in secret and then claim not to have done it? I don't have an answer. <laughs> Can I just say the throwing the water on them is hilarious? Because it's like, how bad are those masks? That they get slightly damp and you fall over and die. Oh no, it's like it's like an M. Night Shyamalan weakness. Oh no, it was water! Mel crawls to the vents and talks to the doctor through the vents. And they sort of plan. Because he's being held by Rudge in this in the big lobby area. And uh, he's like, you need to go to the bridge. Because she's like, we're going to do this big plan. And he's like, don't do that. Go to the bridge and stop the Mogarians. And that's when they go there and they find the dead Mogarians. And they take their faceplates to prove to Rudge that the hijack is over. Basically, your plan is not working. The Mogarians are defeated. When they take their face masks off, they look like human faces, but that have been wearing that mask for too long, so their face kind of melted to it a little. That's what it looked like to me, anyway. Then we do see Ruth one more time, because the Vervoids kill her. She does, she does come back for one scene. <laughs> so Mel, Dolan, and Lasky enter the lounge. They knock Rudge's gun out of his hand. And uh, he runs away and gets killed by the Vervoids. And the doctor announces he's going to search for the audio tape. At this point, I was like, why is this still going on? <laughs> right. What is that not enough? Is there, there's still a murderer going around? He still suspects Doland or Lasky and tells Doland as much. He's like, where would Lasky keep secret stuff? And Dolan's like, well, come here. And then it's like, just kidding. I'm the bad guy. I was the bad guy the whole time. Dolan wants to use the Vervoids as slave labor. And the Vervoids overhear this through the vents or just hanging out somewhere. I don't know. I can't keep track of where everybody is at this point. Everybody's just running around. And I'm like, I don't know who is who and what... Who is where? There's so much going on. But uh, Dolan tries to shoot the doctor, but the gun doesn't work because I believe the doctor gave him the gun, knowing it wasn't didn't have bullets or whatever. And Dolan is taken by the guards. But then Dolan and the guards head out and are both killed by Vervoids. And so they all have this conversation about, like, what do we need to do about the Vervoids? And they explain the motivation of the Vervoids. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Pip and Jane Baker know how plants work. <laughs> Or environments, to be honest. <laughs> I 
doesn't think it's their strong suit. Because they're like, well, plants are always trying to kill animals and animals are always trying to eat plants. I was like, that, that's not... Uh, that's no that's, that's not, not true not at all we all eat plants so of course they would want to kill us so it's kill or be killed this explanation being so weak has like a huge impact on the end of this episode um so lasky is like well i think that's dumb i'm gonna go try to talk to him see if we can talk some sense into these vervoids <laughs> that doesn't sound like it makes any sense but she is killed by the vervoids the bodies are piling up. The doctor and Mel escape through the vents and find the big pile of bodies. Mel's upset about it and he's like, but what do you do with plants in, uh, where you live? You just throw them in a compost heap. That's just a people compost heap. So they're no different than you or I. <laughs> You're right. It's exactly the same. So we, the two doctors was like, meat eaters are bad. And this one's like, plant eaters are bad. What do you what do you eat? Just don't eat. The sixth doctor, the era that wants you to starve, which would explain why Mel keeps wanting the doctor to lose weight. Oh my god. We discovered the secret messages of the sixth doctor era. All food is unethical. <laughs> and you are a bad person. There's no ethical consumption. <laughs> Period. Period. <laughs> So the vervoids are like everywhere. So the doctor comes up with a plan to not kill them, but to accelerate their life cycle. That's totally yeah. different. I feel the doctor's really kind of hedging a bit here. It's, it's, it's like, yeah, if I, if, if I age you to death in seconds, technically I haven't killed you. You just <laughs> live life to its fastest. If I drop you off of... A skyscraper, I have not, not murdered you. That was gravity and the ground. People don't kill people. Guns do. <laughs> <laughs> also, whatever it is that is going to accelerate their life cycle coincidentally happens to be the Mogarian mineral that is on board. Uh, that we the, stole. That Yeah, the Vionesium is what it's called. How convenient that that's the thing that, saw, that saves the day. I mean, again, you could just set them on fire probably but um that would be violent yeah they're like how do we get them all in the same place so they're like we'll turn out the lights and announce that we need to fix the generators and then they'll head to where the generators are the verb voids take the bait and are bombed to death it's fall now bitches <laughs> <laughs> okay they turn into like leaves they're just leaves now just fall colors and then uh, the doctor and male insult each other a little bit but playfully, TARDIS out and sing while they do so. There's like, there's something about the doctor singing voice being bad. I don't remember the exact joke, but he does like some opera on the way out. And then uh, the doctor is very pleased with himself. And he's like, that's a good episode, right? I'm free to go. <laughs> fucking fascinating to me. And they're like, you just showed us that you committed genocide. And he's like, oh shit, I didn't think of that. <laughs> The Gallifreyan legal system fascinates me because technically this should not be called trial of a time lord. It should be called inquiry of a time lord because they keep going, this is an inquiry. And it's like, okay. and But they just change the charges midway through. The Valiar girls actually do this one thing. We're going to change it to this. I'm just like, legal dramas on Gallifrey must be really confusing to watch. But also, they're not They're not wrong. wrong. No, no. And I'm going to... Spoilers, guys. This will never be resolved in any satisfactory way over the oh. next two episodes. I don't know how to break that to you. But, you know. I just don't understand why the doctor was like, oh man, I gotta come up with a case to show him that I'm a good guy. How about this one where I, where I just commit genocide? That's great, right? What was he thinking? He didn't think that through. And like, what the way that this this <laughs> this serial ends, you're like, are we gonna be? Is the next serial just arguing the ethics of genocide? <laughs> it's just a court drama where the doctor's like, well, actually, sometimes genocide is necessary. Well, he, I, he was like, if a single <laughs> leaf got on Earth, then it would destroy everybody. And this but. is what I mean about like their motivation being so weak. It's like the fact that we didn't thoroughly set like it seems like there were other solutions and we just didn't explore them yeah it's it's very much for the drama rather than actually thinking of the consequences which is a fairly good description of this season i think uh in, in total <laughs> but again as i said what why cho choose this one why not choose dr dance's empty child no one dies in that one that's literally the whole point of that story <laughs> 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 it's like... 
I also believe I was watching the like deleted and extended scenes and there was an alternate ending where it shows the leaves and then like one of the vervoids like reinflates. Really? Go. And it's like not dead. Yeah. So, you know, not a total genocide. <laughs> And here's my thing. I feel like a lot of times when stuff like this gets made, you know, when Doctor Who stories like this get to- get told, it is out of some sort of, you know, sense of blindness with the, the writer, right? But then like, getting to the end and and being like, you did genocide. It's like, oh, so you knew that that's the, essentially what this is. And you still told this as a story where the doctor does that. And the doctor, it's not one of the things that the Matrix is lying about. The doctor's like, yes, I did it and I had to. To save Like, Earth. that is a weird position to put yourself in to defending. <laughs> like, I, get, I think if you switch this to being the veil you're doing it, it would make a whole lot more sense. Ultimately, you could do this. You could do this and you could explore the consequences if you had better people writing it. Essentially, this is it. It's not that the show couldn't do this. It's just Pip and Jane Baker, who I, despite what I've said, I don't think are terrible writers. Yeah, they do have their strengths. I, I think this is probably out of all the stories they wrote. Uh, I think this is, this is, this is the weakest of that so it doesn't show it but it's just you need writers on another level to really go okay what happens when the doctor's caught out on committing genocide a justifiable one and you know you're not going to get it in this in this season they don't even have a script editor anymore i mean we already did it not only do we not have a script do i have the right like that is a yeah that is an insane moment that like everybody remembers because it's so impactful i that wasn't even one of my favorite serials but i fucking love that moment in it exactly you know it is an iconic moment in the series that they like I said everyone remembers and you could have something similar here but they don't have a script editor anymore they had an extra year and a half to put these scripts together and no one's worked out what's happening also like the next episode not only doesn't have a script editor but the writer died you get the unique combination of Robert Holmes followed by Pip and Jane Baker again which is not exactly a logical it's not like Robert Holmes followed by Terence Dix you know right. <laughs> it's, it's, right. it's a very very different thing so we got a fun two-parter ahead of us oh I mean I'm quite fond of the ultimate uh, the, uh, the ultimate foe or whatever you want to whatever you want to call it i find it more interesting than this and there were enough good moments in it and i think a genuinely iconic colin moment you, you'll know at the speech in the episode 13 but yeah this whole i mean i i kind of this will come things i love about trying the time lord everything is falling apart but they still kind of managed to get 14 episodes out it's done a lot of interesting things we have finished terror of the vervoids so we're going to take a quick break And we'll be back for our final thoughts. Welcome to Dr. Geek's Laboratory. Dr. Geek here with another reminder that the ESO Network is pro-science and pro-vaccine. We urge you to be a superhero and protect yourself, your family, and your fellow geeks around the world. Don't be fooled by the forces of evil and their anti-science misinformation campaign. Consult the latest CDC guidelines, your doctor, and get the COVID vaccine Straight from the dirty heart of Hollywood, California. We are your home for news, opinions, and interviews from the world of Comic-Cons and fandoms. Your ultimate insiders for all things... And we're back. Tony, do you know what time it is? I do. What time is it? Don't just stare at me. Tell me. <laughs> it is 3.48 oh, p.m. It is uh-huh. the time in the podcast where I do this bit and you thoroughly enjoy it. Oh, I love it. It's the best. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And it's time for? It's time for Final Thoughts. Final Thoughts. Like I was saying, it's it's not Pip and Jane Baker's best by any stretch. It's it's a fascinating episode in many ways, though, because like I said, this is Eric Saywood has I think nothing to do with this. So it's it's kind of pure John Nathan Turner in a way. <laughs> Strength of weaknesses that may have. You've got two experienced writers on, yet this feels like it needs another draft. Like we've said itself, there's there's a murder plot going on that where there aren't really any suspects until they just go, Oh, you did it at the end. There's all this intrigue, but doesn't lead anywhere. There's a lot of weird body issues as well. But I still, you wouldn't think it from half the stuff I said, but I still kind of enjoy it. And I always say about all of Trial of the Time Lord, actually, if somebody was into New Who and they wanted to get into Classic Who, I wouldn't recommend Trial of the Time Lord until I knew that they were in too deep to back out. (laughs) 
us. <laughs> yeah, basically. Once you've got this far in, you're just going to be like, oh, okay. You know, that totally makes sense to me. I totally understand where you're coming from because I have been in this weird situation where I have thoroughly been enjoying Trial of the Time Lord and then we'll get to the end of a, a serial and be like, I really want to know how they answer these questions and then, you know, we'll have guests on the podcast and they go, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, uh... Don't look too too much too forward to that because uh, <laughs> you might not get any. And it's a weird part of Doctor Who where they are doing new interesting things. They are asking interesting questions. And it just because of the way that it was made that and I've I have been in this situation where you are laying down tracks in front of a moving a moving train and just hoping that it the whole thing doesn't crash and you all die like. <laughs> When stuff gets made like that, it's a mess. <laughs> I totally understand having like a fondness for for Trial of the Time Lord specifically. I'm a little bit less with you on this specific episode. <laughs> I think it's probably the weakest of all the stories in some ways. Because I feel like Mysterious Planet, it's Robert Holmes doing himself. But it's still, you know, he's still at that stage where it's it's entertaining enough. And, and Mind Warp has a kind of nasty edge that I quite enjoy to it. And it has Brian Blessed as well, you know. And I think Ultimate Foe, I, again, maybe because it's just two part of Hells. But actually there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there, genuinely. But yeah, this is definitely the weakest of them, it's also a, a period of time where, apart from one episode, Pip and Jane Breaker are going to write the next two Dot Two stories because they obviously do one episode of Ultimate Foe, and then they'll do Time and the Rani. So you're you're on the Pip and Jane Baker era right now. This is a fascinating era of Doctor Who. It's kind of like watching the best of the show fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I would say it's not even like uh, that. There's no murder suspects as much as there are too many. And all of them sort of pay off. You have Bruckner, who's going to just kill everybody in a black hole. You have Rudge, who is like betrayed everybody for money. You have Doland, who is like going to use the Vervoids as slave labor. You have, I don't know, like everybody has not only motive, but also does terrible things. So it's like, I don't... (laughs) Right, they have, in fact, committed some crime. Even Lasky is, like, I feel, like, somewhat complicit in, like, I don't know, making these vervoids or whatever. She says that, and it's like, yeah, you're very complicit. You've got, like, this woman in a box. (laughs) You're super duper complicit. Am I responsible for these murdering plant creatures that I created? Hmm. I just feel just a smidge guilty. I don't know. I can't shake the feeling that I might have played some part in this. Oh, well, time to do some more exercise. Don't disturb me. (laughs) And I kind of enjoy it for that, like, bonkers level of just everything. Like, I love a thing that's, like, jam-packed full of stuff. But it it also just, like, it feels... It never never coalesces. Yeah, it never coalesces. Like, if that was, like, your point, is, like, there's all this shit going on. Like, it's all bad. That's one thing, but that doesn't necessarily feel like that's the point they're trying to make. They're just, like, we're putting in some red herrings. But I'm like, no, your red herrings are pretty bad. Like, they're also, you know, they're not, like, things that lead you away from the main mystery. It's they, like a whole other extra plot. Yeah. Yeah. There isn't really a main mystery, necessarily. And the one that is, there is one, but it's, like, not as interesting as, like, just the, everything in total. But, yeah, I, I enjoy the, the, this one has a more goofy tone, I feel like. It feels like something that would be more in the, like, you know, creature of the pit type of era so i kind of enjoy the tone of it a little bit because there's like the goofy magic tricks and the it it is nice seeing the doctor and mel have a slightly better uh, i mean other than the fat shaming their dynamic is a lot nicer (laughs) a lot kinder one Um, of them isn't constantly weeping (laughs) yeah and that's great and no one's just going on and on about how hot mel is it's definitely i do think it's definitely the weakest one it doesn't have as many so far (laughs) yeah so far it definitely doesn't have as interesting of ideas as the uh, mysterious planet or mind warp i actually really kind of really liked mind warp i like what mind warp was doing i wish like it seems like a good setup for something that does not pay off in this serial and apparently does not pay off in the next serial either it works dramatically interestingly and this one It's weird to have, like, this very dramatic big cliffhanger of, like, oh, shit, Perry's dead, and what was real, what wasn't, and then it's just, like, here's a goofy murder mystery for four episodes. So, it's, like, tonal whiplash, but not terrible. Like, if you take it on its own, it's 
it's it's fine but uh yeah that's my uh that's my final thoughts before we go is there anything that you would like to plug yes i would like to plug the real mccoy which is my dot two podcast that i do with my friend eric uh, which is, as the clever name may suggest, an in-depth look at the Sylvester McCoy era. We've done the televised stories, and we've started moving to look at, not all, but uh, selected new adventure novels. So if you want us to look, discuss Dot 2 when 20-year-old writers side introduce nudity and drugs, this is your time <laughs> to tune in. Fun. Uh, we're about to jump into that era ourselves. I, I, I envy you. It's always a good era to jump into. Ob- obviously, I think that. But you, you've got light at the end of the tunnel. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I have, for the first time, an absence of plugs. I mean, you know, go ahead and watch The Unseen World on a real good TV. I, I have new stuff coming out soon. Uh, I've got The Dip articles, which you can see all my articles at thedip.com slash author slash Joe. And I'm going to be uh, in a new podcast soon. I don't, I'm not sure when it's coming out, but we're we're doing a deep dive into all of Star Wars. So keep an eye out for Legendary Forces. That's the name of that podcast. We just did uh, the Star Wars holiday special. So like, Terror of the Vervoids is an absolute treat. I'll tell you, in comparison. <laughs> but uh, if you like this episode of the podcast, you can check out more on WatchYourAssalon.com. You can also find our podcast, our Patreon, our Amazon wish list, and more at Linktree slash Watchathon. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Watchathon. And special thanks again to Matt Golden for sponsoring this episode. Hey, thanks, Matt. Golden! Check him out at MatthewGolden.net. And I want to give a special shout out to Vince and E.L. for providing us with our amazing theme song. Thank you, Vince! And check out more of their music at SoundCloud.com slash Vince and E.L. or VincentEL.BandCamp.com. And tune in next time when we talk about the final serial of The Trial of a Time Lord, the end of the sixth Doctor, the Trial of Time Lord Part 4, The Ultimate Foe, which we are going to open up to all of our guests. Whoever wants to be on it can be on it. We specifically want everyone who's done uh, the trial so that they can leave their final verdict of their whether or not... final, final thoughts. Final, final thoughts. Of whether or not the Doctor is guilty. <laughs> whether this show should be cancelled. I mean, the, the Doctor truly committed genocide. I don't think it's the only time he's done it. Remember when he flooded Atlantis? That was a time. I do remember. <laughs> but uh, until then, keep calm and wrestle on. Goodbye, and I love you in a platonic, parasocial way. Bye. Wish I could get rid of my waste as easily, eh? <laughs> the charge must now be genocide. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.